evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to beautiful Yardley Hall for the Polsky Practical Personal Enrichment Series. I'm Emily Fowler. I'm the Polsky Series Director. And before we get started, I'd like to request that you turn off any cell phones or pagers, Blackberries, other communication devices you have on your person, or at least put them on silent or vibrate. Thank you. Oh, thank you. The Polsky Practical Personal Enrichment Series is underwritten by Norman and Elaine Polsky Family Supporting Foundation within the Greater Kansas City Community Foundation in partnership with Johnson County Community College. It includes topics which are not being offered anywhere else where successful local professionals share their knowledge to benefit you. Tonight, the interest in this program caused us to move into Yardley Hall, as you know, but for those of you that don't know, Norman Elaine Polsky's name graces the Polsky Theater just across the lobby from where we sit right now, where a variety of events are held each year. And we want to thank Norman and Elaine for their generosity, which also brings you tonight's Polsky series. Norman and Elaine support organizations across Kansas City and the nation, enriching our community and communities across the world. Thanks, Norman and Elaine. Let me take one quick moment to acknowledge Mundy and Yazdi Oriental Rugs for our rug on the stage this evening, and also to thank our TV and Carlson Center production crews for their assistance in making the move to Yardley Hall tonight. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the packet. If you did not get a packet already this evening, we do have more remaining, so pick one up on your way out. But I'd like to go through what's inside right now for you. And uh, remember to take this home, share it with your family, and uh, let them know what you've learned this evening. First, on the right side, an overview of the material we'll cover during tonight's seminar, including a few of Adam Bold's featured slides, his Ten Commandments of Investing, and his biography. Those are on the right-hand side. And on the left side, first of all, we have a blue card for questions. So if you have a question during the evening, please jot it down on this blue card. And when you're asked, pass it to an aisle, and the ushers will come along, and they'll pick these up from you. So we'd like to have these in hand by the time we get ready to start our question and answer period. So whenever you have a question card filled out, just hold it up and, and shake it. Somebody will come and get it from you. And also, the green survey card is in the packet as well. This allows you to add yourself to our mailing list if you're not already on it. You can suggest future topics for the series, and you can also give us a little bit of feedback so we know what we're doing well and what we can improve as we move from tonight to our next seminar. So please hand these in before you leave tonight. I will get a call from Norman in the morning, and he'll want to know how many Polsky survey cards did we get, and I want you yours to be among them, so please don't forget to leave that with us tonight. Behind the cards, on blue, is Norman's My Legacy to You, Achieving Financial Independence, and his 11 Strategies for Mutual Fund Investing. On the back of the blue sheet is an overview of the stock market's performance over the past 50 years. On the green sheet is Norman's quarterly article showing his own investment results, and on the back of the green sheet is his investment history. If you would like to receive Norman's quarterly article, his address is on this green sheet near the bottom, and you can send him four self-addressed stamped envelopes to that address, and he'll be happy to mail it to you each quarter. He mails out about 45 across the city, so if you'd like to be included, we'd be happy to do that. On purple are biographies of Norm and Elaine Polsky. On the back, you'll see a list of their 43 endowments that they currently fund. On the white sheet are our topics for 2007. And the yellow flyer includes Norm's Ten Commandments, originally shared at his alma mater, Purdue University, in 1992. And on the back of that, information about Kindness is Contagious, a program Norm's involved in that is sponsored by the Stop Violence Coalition. If you go back to the white sheet, you'll notice that our next seminar is on August 13th. That is a Monday that breaks away from our usual Wednesday evening, but we'll, we'll be featuring Congressman Dennis Moore and Senator Pat Roberts 
in a discussion of what's going on in Washington. And I know that we all would like to know what's going on in Washington. So I hope you'll join us for that on August 13th. If you'd like to get tickets, they're currently on sale. You can call the box office first thing, first thing in the morning and get your name on the list. And lastly, a gold slip is inside the gold ticket that tells you about three books for sale in the lobby this evening. Adam Bold's The Bold Truth About Mutual Funds for $10. Jim Stowers, Yes, You Can Achieve Financial Independence for $10. That retails at $25. And Tony DePardo's book, Life, Love, Music, and Football for $15. That retails for $25. You'll also notice that tonight's program is being taped for broadcast on JCCC-TV, which can be found on Time Warner, Channel 17, or Comcast, Channel 22. Links to Polsky Series broadcasts can also be found on the college's website at video.jccc.edu, where you can watch anytime. This program will start airing uh, later this week, so surf by the JCCC channel if you have a moment and check it out. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's session with Adam Bold. Adam is the founder, executive chairman, and chief investment officer of the Mutual Fund Store, which he started in 1996. Adam Store has exploded into a nationally branded company with 15, oh, excuse me, with 56 locations in 47 cities, and he serves nearly 16,000 clients. He also hosts the Mutual Fund Show, heard live in 47 radio markets across the country, locally here on KMBZ 980 AM, Saturday mornings at 10 o'clock. Adam and the Mutual Fund Store have won many honors over the past few years, but I will let him tell more about that himself. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Mr. Adam Bold. Thanks, Emily. Thank you all for coming this evening. Um, it's hard for me to compete with a Royals-Cardinals game. Um, were I not here, I would be there. And uh, although that is a labor of love these days, isn't it? Last year, uh, in my presentation, I had a slide of, of the Chiefs and a slide of the Royals. And the reason I, I put those in there is because I find as I travel across the country and I go and I, I speak to, to different groups that when I put slides in at the local sports teams, and everybody goes, yay, and it makes them feel good, and they go, hey, that guy was, that was entertaining. Uh, but I think that the Royals might not help this year. So uh, you, you will not have any of that there. Um, first and foremost, I want to uh, thank Norm and Elaine Polsky. Um, Norm uh, is just a gem of a man. Um, he is somebody who I have come to know very well somebody that I uh, respect uh, very deeply. And uh, Norman and Elaine, I want to thank you very much for, for inviting me to be here. And of course, to Johnson County Community College for, for hosting us this evening. So uh, before I get to the agenda, I always like to start with a little, I hesitate to call it a joke because that's a, like, that sets it up that it might be funny. So um, instead, I'll, I'll say a humorous anecdote. So. This doctor, lawyer, and stockbroker are traveling through the country one evening, and their car breaks down. And so they go to this, this farmhouse, and they say to the farmer, hey, um, our car's broken down. Could, could, could you give us a place to stay for the evening? So the farmer says, I, I, that's fine, but in my guest bedroom, I only have two beds, so one of you is going to have to sleep in the barn. The doctor says, all right, I'll, I'll sleep in the barn. So he goes out, and about 10 minutes later, there's a knock on the door and it's the doctor. And he says, look, I got a little problem. He goes, I, I was willing to volunteer to sleep in the barn, but I'm Hindu and there's a cow in the barn and it would kind of be against my religion for me to, to, to sleep, sleep out in the barn. So the doctor, lawyer, lawyer says, okay, I'll go sleep in the barn. So the lawyer goes out there. About 10 minutes later, knock on the door. The lawyer says, I, I was willing to sleep in the barn, but here's the problem. He goes, I'm Jewish and there's a pig in the barn and it would kind of be against my religion. I can't really sleep in the barn with, with the pig. So the stockbroker says, all right, I'll, I'll go out there. So about 10 minutes later, he comes back. There's a knock at the door, and it's the pig and the cow. <laughs> okay. It's on the verge of a joke. It's, it's somewhere between a humorous anecdote and a joke. All right, here's my agenda for the, this evening. Uh, I'm going to take just a couple minutes and 
uh, tell you what's going on with my company, the Mutual Fund Store. This evening is not designed to be a commercial for the Mutual Fund Store. And so, but I was told by my handlers that I had to say something about the Mutual Fund Store. So I'm going to get that out of the way first. Then I'm going to talk about five things that I think are wrong with the financial services industry and what I would do to fix those things. And then I will be happy to answer your questions, which, um, of course, we're writing on the blue card. Was, uh, I, I was having a hard time keeping track of all the different colored cards there for a minute. Um, so what's going on? Um, we are now at the mutual fund store. We have 56 stores in 47 cities. Um, I'm proud to say we just opened our second location in the Kansas City metropolitan area up in, in the north part of the city in Liberty. It's at, actually at the, the shops of Shoal Creek. So uh, we're excited about that. And we are opening about two stores per month. Um, and we really now, we go coast to coast. We're from uh, San Francisco to Washington, D.C. We are border to border, Grand Rapids, Michigan to Houston, Texas. Um, and pretty much everywhere in between. So I'm, I'm really proud of what my team at the Mutual Fund Store has uh, accomplished. Um, in April, I hired a gentleman by the name of David Byers to be the CEO of the Mutual Fund Store. And uh, David used to be the chief operating officer at H&R Block. And really, the, the reason I did that was that um, I find that in, in this world, there are things that people are really good at and things that they aren't. Well, every day that goes by that our company gets bigger is a day that the company is bigger than one that I've ever run before. And so while I could have trialed and erred my way through the next level of growth that we have with the company, I decided that it would be smarter to hire somebody who's already done it before, and David Byers is that guy. Uh, we now have more than 80 investment advisors across the country. And uh, we managed just under three and a half billion dollars. Um, I did win the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 2006, which, um, by the way, was the, the third time I'd been nominated. I was a finalist twice before, and then they finally gave it to me. That was pretty cool. <laughs> Always the bridesmaid. Eventually the bride. There, there's a lesson that try, try again thing. Um, and then in 2007, uh, just... Uh, this month, we were uh, named one of the champions of business by the Kansas City Business Journal, which was a really, really neat award. And the thing that I like about it so much was, number one, we were in really great company. Uh, some of the other companies that, that won the Champions of Business Award were companies like Garmin, uh, HNTB, some really great, prominent Kansas City companies. The other thing that I really, really liked about it was the fact that it, a lot of these awards that we win, they go, okay, this award goes to Adam. Adam gets this. This was not an Adam Award. This was a company award. And um, I've got a number of my, my people here this evening. But uh, I can tell you that while I will take credit for thinking of the concept of the Mutual Fund Store, um, it's these people who have really executed it. And uh, I'm really proud of all of them. Uh, oh, and uh, just this past week, the Business Journal has, you know, they've got that big list in there every week. They have the fastest growing Kansas City companies. Uh, we were on that list and within the top 10 for the fifth year in a row, which um, I'm pretty excited about as well. Okay, let's get started. Five things I think are wrong with the financial services industry. First of all, it is too complicated. Um, for about 200 years, We've had a financial services industry in the United States, and for that 200-year period, the financial services companies have had a vested interest in making each and every one of us think that investing is really complicated. Because if it's complicated, then you need them to deal with it. If it's simple, then you can do it yourself. Um, so we have things like hedge funds, derivatives, hedge funds. I mean, hedge funds have been, I mean, have just there are literally now tens of thousands of hedge funds. We didn't have those years, and they all have these, fan when, you, when you read about them, they have these fantastic strategies and all these things they're doing about, you know, it, it, but most people don't need that. Maybe if you're, the, if you're running the endowment fund for Harvard University or something like that, you need to have 
a hedge fund strategy, but if you're just a normal person, you don't need that. Derivatives, exchange traded funds, uh, there's a lot of press about ETFs. And I get calls to the radio show almost every week now about ETFs. What do you, what do you think about this ETF? Or are you going to start using ETFs for, for your clients at the mutual fund store? And uh, the bottom line is that an ETF is an exchange traded fund. All it is is a mutual fund that instead of trading once a day the way that regular open-end mutual funds that, that we all, uh, you know, what we consider to be a regular mutual fund, these are funds that trade all day long. So if you want, you could buy it when you have a day like today where the market was lower in the morning and then ended up on the high of the day. You could buy it in the morning and you could sell it in the afternoon and you can make a profit. That is, if you know for a fact that it's going to be higher in the afternoon than it was in the morning. And, you know, I don't know how anybody can know those things. Um, and there's a day trading. Um, a lot of the day trading went away. Now a lot of the day trading is coming back. Um, recently, CNBC had a contest. It was the, They called it their Million Dollar Portfolio Challenge. And the prize was a million dollars, um, but it was over a seven-week period. Now, how do you win a contest that's seven weeks long? Well, what you do is you pick a stock that is cheap in price, less than a dollar, maybe 75 cents per share. And if it goes to a dollar within that set, if you get lucky, then you can win a contest like that. But the reality is that that's just, that's luck. That's not skillful investing. And um, anything can happen in, in seven weeks. Most people don't need to do it. Currency trading, I see a lot of advertisements um, on the internet. Now, a lot of advertisements that come to me in the mail. Oh, you can make money trading currency. You can make money trading oil. You can make money trading gold. Um, all these kinds of, of strategies. And the reality is, while those things are very entertaining, it, well, you don't need it. It, this, th it doesn't need to be that complicated. And then annuities. I'll, I'll talk about annuities a, a little bit later, but um, they go on my list. All right. My second thing is what I call making money for the wrong people. Um, and I'm going to talk about this for um, some extended period of time. Uh, first of all, the remember back in 2003, we had a mutual fund scandal. And that is still sort of being wrapped up at this point. Um, but essentially what happened here was there were certain, these, these mutual fund companies that had a group of, of special investors that they allowed to make special trades um, and to engage in activities that were illegal. They were trades that are against the rules, and they are trades that, though, in exchange for that, they were things that were very profitable for the mutual fund companies. So what the mutual fund companies did was they put their own financial interests ahead of the interests of the people who are investing in their funds. And I, you know, I have, I've been pretty consistent on this. Jana Strong, MFS, PBHG, AIM, Invesco, there's, there's a number of these fund companies that were involved. Now, my issue is this, and that is that I'm confident that they will never again do what they did because they ended up having to pay hundreds of millions of dollars in fines for the, the, this naughtiness that they, that's a technical investment term, by the way, naughtiness. Um, this naughtiness that they, they engaged in was, uh, you know, they won't do that again. But the question is, the next time that these people are presented with an opportunity to do something that is sort of shady, uh, might hurt the investors, who invest in their funds but is profitable for the fund company, what will they do? Well, I find that it's really hard to pick mutual funds. There's 20, I've got more than 23,000 in my database. Um, so as, if I go through that whole process of trying to weed through 23,000 funds and pick out the very best ones, when I get all done with that process, if I have to go, yeah, but I wonder if they'll act ethically the next time they're presented with a, a gray area, um, I just assume stay with companies that have acted ethically and have acted in their shareholders' best interest the whole way, and that way we don't even have to ask the question. Edward Jones. Um, 
Okay, so here's what Edward Jones did. Edward Jones um, ended up paying uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in fines and penalties for engaging in an activity where uh, they have what they call their preferred list of mutual funds. And so if you're a customer of Edward Jones and you go to the Edward Jones broker and you say, okay, I need help with my investments, they recommend these funds to you and they'll say, these are fr from our preferred list of funds. And as, a, a, as a, an investor, as a, a normal person, you can, when somebody says it's on their preferred list, it seems as if what happens is what what's happened is that the firm has gone through the process of looking at all the mutual fund companies out there, doing their research, and figuring out that these seven or eight companies are the very best mutual fund companies out there. Well, as it turns out, that's not at all what happened. What happened was that these companies paid Edward Jones hundreds of millions of dollars in order to be on the preferred list. And so that when they were recommending those funds, they weren't recommending them because they were better for their customers. They were recommending these funds because Edward Jones made a lot of money. And when I say a lot of money, um, we're talking about $282 million. Now, one other point I want to make about, here, make that go back. See, that was cool. Um, one other point that I want to make. So Edward Jones pays these hundreds of millions of dollars in fines for doing this. So you'd think that would make them stop doing it, right? Guess what? They are still doing it today. The only difference between, the only reason that they're still doing it today is what they actually paid the fines for it was not for that behavior, which was putting funds on a list saying that they're preferred, but they're preferred because they got money. What they got in trouble for was doing it without telling their customers. So now, they still do the exact same thing. But what they do is they tell, they disclose it to their customers. Now, how do they disclose it? Nice form, you know, by the way, I want you to know you're, you're, uh, we're getting money. No, what they do is they send this to their customers. Now, um, what it, this, first of all, this is one of those things where you have to be careful when you open it so you don't like turn it into confetti as you're, you're trying to open it. Um, so you get this in the mail, important information about your account. How many times have you guys got, gotten some of these? Um, second of all, and then it talks about on the back, um, consolidated statement of financial condition, rights to your free credit balances, order execution and routing processes. That's without even opening it. So that, that's what you see. Oh, this is really exciting stuff. Um, there's stuff about um, their privacy policy, all that stuff. And then there's a little phrase in here that says um, that Edward Jones, um, this is beautiful. Um, I, I, let me find this one because I highlighted it in this one. Doesn't make for good television, but um, this is what I love. Um, for the year ended December 31, 2005, Edward Jones received approximately $172 million in revenue sharing payments from the preferred fund families. For that same period, Edward Jones' net income was $330 million. So more than half of their net income came not from servicing their clients, but rather from these secret under the table payments that they got from the mutual fund companies. They're still doing it today, and this is how they disclose it to their customers. I contend this is not adequate disclosure because the odds of anybody reading this are very, very slim. Um, Ameriprise Financial Services. Um, this happened about 60 days ago. Oh, for those of you who may not know, Ameriprise Financial Services is the former American Express Financial Advisors, and they also, they changed the name, they used to have the AXP funds, and they've now changed it to Riversource. So what would happen uh, at, um, at Ameriprise is you would go in there and uh, you would pay them a fee for them to put together a financial plan for you. And the concept was, that, that okay, that's a valid concept. You pay money, they give you a plan. But as it turns out, the advice that they gave you always included the American Express and now the River Source funds. So while you thought you were, you were get, paying to get objective advice, in actuality you weren't. And the thing that staggered me 
about this $100 million was that there were 2,450,000 clients that were eligible for a part of the $100 million. Now think about that. Um, at the mutual fund store, I was talking earlier about the success that we've had. We have somewhere between 16 and 18,000 clients nationwide. These guys get 2,450,000 clients and stick to them all. Sweet. I mean, I wish I had like 25% of the clients that they have, let alone, and, and you know, do nice things for them. And these guys get that many clients and, and do that. Uh, Countryside Bank, they run these ads in the Kansas City Star, six and a quarter percent CD, guaranteed FDIC insured. That sounds like a pretty sweet deal, doesn't it? In today's world, six and a quarter percent guaranteed in a CD? Yeah, well, it's a good deal for them. Let me tell you the way this CD works. Number one, it is a 20 year CD. Okay. Number two, it is a callable CD. So here's the way it works. You buy it today, and it's six and a quarter. That six and a quarter, at any, um, you get that, you're guaranteed that rate for one year. That you, uh, you will get six and a quarter. Now here's what happens. If interest rates go up, and so instead of paying six and a quarter, you could now go to the bank and buy a CD that paid 7% or 7.5%, then you're stuck with this thing for 20 years because it's a 20 year CD. If, on the other hand, interest rates go down, and so instead of paying six and a quarter, you would go to the bank and they would pay 5% on a CD, then they can call it away from you after that first year. So the bottom line is it's just a teaser rate. It's a great deal for them because if they, if whichever way interest rates go, the bank is completely protected. Whichever way the interest rates go, you're pretty much stuck. Um, this is a point I want to make. Um, I'd like to consider uh, the mutual fund store to be the most ethical company in the country when it comes to how we treat our clients. Um, but we are not the only ones. The, while I talk bad about, I, first of all, I can't talk bad because that's an adjective and I can talk badly because that's an adverb. Um, so I sometimes say bad things about the activities that some of these companies engage in. Um, but um, I want you to know that the vast majority of investment advisors, the vast majority of these people, they really would, they would rather do well for their clients than poorly. Uh, but the bottom line is that there are still a lot of these, client, these companies that don't. Um, we start with the philosophy, if it's good for the client, it'll ultimately be good for us. And regardless of whether it's the mutual fund store or some other advisor, I think that you should expect that your company, that whatever investment advisory firm you're dealing with, uh, or brokerage house, that they, they start with this premise. We have to do what's right for the client. Third, pay for advice, not for products. Um, for, for years, the financial services industry has been based on a commission model, unless you were rich. Now, for, for forever and for always, if you had $10 million, you could go to Goldman Sachs or you could go to the private client group at Bank of America, or you could go to Lehman Brothers, and they would manage your money for a fee. You give them their money, they charge you a fee, uh, a percentage of the assets under management in exchange for the advice that they're providing. If you were a normal person, a normal investor with, some, you know, with less than $10 million to invest, then what you got were products. They sold you mutual funds that had a load up front, they sold you stocks, got to pay a commission to buy it, commission to sell it, whatever the, the case may be. Um, when people go to a financial advisor, whether it be Merrill Lynch, Payne Weber, the mutual fund store, whatever, w you're not saying, I want to buy some investments. What you're saying is, I have money, and I have dreams and goals and aspirations. I have things that I want to accomplish. Help me take my money and get to my dreams, goals, and aspirations. Um, so what you want to pay for is the advice, not for the products. Um, the advisor needs to tell you all the ways they get paid. Edward Jones should not do it in a little brochure that has a bunch of other legal mumbo jumbo in it and gets mailed to people after they've already become a client of Edward Jones. Rather, they should just tell you up front, we, we get paid more money for selling these products than these products. 
uh, the people at Ameriprise. They should say, okay, we're going to prepare a financial plan for you, but I want you to know it's going to include funds from my mutual fund company. Okay? And that way, at least if they tell you, then you can just, you know, if you're fine with it, fine. But you, you can't make an informed decision if you don't have all the facts. So you need to know. Um, the, a lot of these mutual fund companies will do things like um, they'll come to us, and, and of course we, we don't do this, but at the brokerage houses, they'll say, okay, if you sell a million dollars worth of our mutual funds, you will get a free trip to Florida. If you sell $5 million worth, you'll get a trip someplace else. If you sell $10 million worth, you'll get a trip to Europe, whatever the case may be. And so the broker wants to get this trip. Next thing you know, you're walking into, you walk into their office and they go, oh, these are, I, I'm recommending these mutual funds for you. And it's not because they were best for the client. It's because the broker wants to go on the free trip. Um, the bottom, and of course, you guys know, but we, we don't, at my company, we don't take any money from anybody. And believe me, we get offered stuff all the time. Um, so they need to tell you, hey, I want you to know, I'm recommending these funds because I think they're best for you, but I also want you to know if I sell enough of them, I get a free trip. Okay, you know, if they tell you, that's fair. Now you can decide whether you want to do it or not. But if they don't tell you, then you don't know, have all the facts. And advisors should avoid even the potential for a conflict of interest. Um, uh, you know, th there are things that, there are ways that mutual fund companies can sort of backdoor um, induce people to sell certain funds over others. They will do things like say, well, if you want to have um, an event for all your clients, you invite all your clients and we'll have it at a restaurant, we'll have dinner and stuff like that, and then one particular mutual, well, the mutual fund company will pay for that party for your clients. And the reason they're doing that is because the broker had sold a certain amount of that, that company's funds. Uh, there, there's a lot of sneaky ways and a lot of things, so I just say, you just don't take any money from anybody. No golf balls, no t-shirts, no nothing, and that way there, there's not even a potential for a conflict of interest. Third, this little thing I call prospectuses are stupid. Um, so, first of all, I, um, when I put this presentation together, I send it out to several people within my company and, hey, proofread this, make sure I don't have any typos, whatever the case may be. And we, uh, w one of my people and I got into a very long discussion about whether it is prospecti or prospectuses. Um, we ended on prospectuses because dictionary.com says that prospectuses is the plural for prospectus. Um, I'm not sure that's right, um, but dictionary.com, how can you, you know, argue with those guys? Um, so here's what happened. We had those mutual fund scandals, and we had these fee sharing arrangements, and we've had all this stuff. So what the government did, the, the SEC, which is the government agency that's in charge of regulating mutual funds, they said, okay, um, we don't want this stuff to happen anymore. So what we're going to do instead is we are going to include more disclosure in the perspective. We're going to tell people uh, about all these arrangements. We're going to tell them all this stuff that potentially could go wrong. And so what ends up happening is that you end up with these huge um, pers prospectuses uh, for a mutual fund. Now, I contend that really what's happened is that by disclosing more, they have made the prospectus thicker. And they've made the type smaller. And by disclosing more, they have decreased the likelihood of anybody really reading this thing. Um, so what do you do about it? Um, yeah, the P and so, so what do we do about this? Let me just flip through that real quick. Um, the SEC has a proposal, which I have been talking about. I, I like to call it the Adam Bold rule. Um, I, you know, they don't call it that, and they probably don't. Well, they know who I am because they regulate me too, but um, th I've been talking about this for a long time. What they should do is instead of this, instead of this document that nobody's going to read, you know, the people that really need to read it, there's a two-page document, and it will tell you everything you need to know about, it'll tell you about the past performance, it'll tell you about the manager, it'll tell you about the fees and expenses, it'll tell you what they do, 
Now, if I were writing the rules, there, there would be one more rule, and that is no more than two pages and no words over three syllables. Um, I would make it the USA Today of prospectuses. Um, the bottom line is that most people, I mean, the only people that read stuff like this are mutual fund geeks like me, right? Um, I, I did this last year, and I'm, I'm going to do it again this year. How many people in this room have ever read a prospectus? Okay, now, here's question two. Follow-up question. How many people in this room have thrown away ten, ti ten times or more the number of prospectuses that they've ever read? Yeah. So that's the bottom line, is that this, but if it was two pages, the odds, I'm not saying everybody would read it, but if it's two pages, the odds go up that, that people who need to know what's going on will read it. Now, they will still have this. And if you ask for it, they'll give it to you. But the bottom line is that there'll be some uniformity, and um, we'll see in September whether the government does the right thing or not. Um, this one I call Expect More Than Magic Beans. Um, remember the uh, Jack and the Beanstalk? And so Jack gives the guy his money. Um, the guy gives Jack the magic beans. And, of course, at first his mother is very upset with him. Um, well, I contend that that's what happens a lot with investors and brokers, investment advisors, et, et cetera. And that is that uh, people go and they will say, okay, I need help with my, I need some investment advice. And, and the broker goes, all right, give me your money and then it'll grow into this big beanstalk and you can go up there and get the golden harp from the giant. Um, you should expect more than magic beans. Number one, you should expect that your advisor will know you. Um, typically, when you go to a broker, an advisor, etc., what they will do is they will say, okay, are, uh, how old are you? Are you conservative, moderate, or aggressive? How long is it going to be before you retire? Or how much income do you need? And that's it. Um, I contend that's not enough. That's why in uh, our client profile, we do things like, we, um, we ask questions like, you just heard the market went down 10%. Do you A, want to sell everything? B, you're concerned but continue to monitor the market? Or C, you want to put more money in because things are low? That's a real life question that really tells us something about you. And they have to periodically call you or contact you and go, hey, is everything, anything changed? Everything's still going okay? I think you should expect that your advisor will make periodic reviews of your account and um, and let you know that they've done it. It's not enough for them just to review your account. They have to review your account, and then I mean, th we do it primarily by email. Hey, Mr. Client, just want you to know I looked at your account. Everything looks cool, or we we've made these changes, or whatever the case may be. So periodic reviews and let you know. Um, when they make a mistake, they need to, look, to admit that they've made a mistake. Um, I know this is going to be hard to believe, but even I, I make mistakes sometimes. Um, but when I do, I try and catch them as quickly as I can and, and make a change. I can, I can say with good faith to a customer, look, there was a reason I bought this thing. It hasn't worked out the way I thought it would. I guess it's time to, uh, you know, I'm going to do something different. No matter how much confidence I have in the manager, no matter how good I think this, this investment is, too many brokers, the customer, first of all, th they will never call the customer. The customer calls them and says, well, you sold me this thing five years ago. I don't think it's doing very, they, very well. And they go, just hang on to it. It'll, it'll come back. And the reason they do that is because they don't want to admit that they made a mistake. Um, I think it's a lot smarter to admit when you make a mistake and catch it as quickly as you can. Comparative performance disclosure. If I tell you that your fund made 10% over the last year, is that good? Well, it's sort of like if I told you that the Royals scored three runs last night. Is that good? Some days it is, most days it isn't. Um, but the, can you guys tell that the Royals thing is really bugging me? Um, <laughs> the, um, the, the, the bottom line is that 10%, 12% targets, you can't, Norman and I were talking earlier today about targets. Why don't brokers say, well, I'm going to make you 10% a year? Well, the reason you can't do that is because you have to compare it to something. If the market's making 20 and I get you 10, I haven't done you I haven't done you, added any value at all to your financial situation. 
if the market made five and we made 10, and the market made five and we made seven, then we've added the value. Um, and when they disclose that performance, it needs to be net of all fees, and you need to see what the fees are. There are a lot of companies, like these annuity companies, what they do is you buy the annuity, they'll say, oh, you don't have to pay a load to buy this, and then you know they're taking fees every single month out of that account, but they take it out of the performance. So you never really see the fees. I say the fees should be transparent. You should, if you're paying fees, if you're that you should be able to know exactly how much those fees are. Um, lastly, new doesn't always mean improved. Um, most there there are new the mutual fund. I mean, there have been eight thousand mutual funds created in the last three years. Think of it. There's 23,000 total. Three years ago, there were 15,000. Now there's 23,000. Why does that happen? Because the marketing departments of these mutual fund companies keep thinking of new things they can sell. The, as we all know, the markets in China and India have done really well over the last several years. So guess what? Every mutual fund company is coming out with China and India funds. Those people will buy it because it's something that, that has done really well in the recent past. Um, the bottom line is that um, the, we don't need more mutual funds. We need better mutual funds. And we, rather than make, keep making more, maybe they should spend their time trying to make the ones they have better. Um, the, there's been a whole wave of new products created to um, appeal to scared investors. Um, I don't know if you guys remember um, 2000 through 2002. Do you remember that? It was kind of a long, it was like a bad time in the market. Remember that? Yeah? Okay. I, I always said those three years were the worst decade of my life. Um, <laughs> the, what happened was that bear market that we had from 2000 to 2002, I believe that it changed the psyche of two generations of Americans. That, pe that, that, that we have been deeply affected forever and for always by that bear market. And I liken it to my grandmother. I, um, last month, my 92-year-old grandmother, um, I'm not supposed to say that, my um, more than 80-year-old grandmother um, <laughs> who lives in upstate New York, I, I went and helped her buy a new car. Um, I promised my grandpa when he passed away that I would look after my grandma and her finances and stuff like that. So her car broke down and she needed a new car. So we go up there and I take her to lunch and we're sitting at lunch at this restaurant and she, she's not, you know, famously rich, but ex extremely comfortable and will be for the rest of her life. So we're having lunch and she's taking sugar packets out of the, um, the thing at the restaurant and she's putting them in her purse. Okay, now, um, my grandmother is not a kleptomaniac. Um, she is not a stealer by nature, but there was a time in her life, in her childhood, when they didn't have sugar. And so it's, you know, she knows that she can always go to the store and buy sugar, but there's something in her psyche from the depression, from rationing during World War II, where she has, there, there were times in her life where she went without sugar. And it is still to this day affecting her and her behavior. Well, I contend that the bear market is doing the same thing to everybody who was invested in the market in 2000. And so what happens is, whereas during the 80s, if we, in the, in the early 90s, if we had a market correction where the market went down 10 or 15%, people would go, oh, that kind of sucks, we're having a correction, it'll come back. Now, anytime we get the slightest little downturn in the market, people go, ah, oh, it's, it's happening again, I, I, I can't do this again. Even though we've had four years in a row of really great markets, this has, effect, and as a result, there are a lot of major financial services companies that are preying on those on people's fears and they're selling these products that have supposed guarantees and you know and it sounds like you put your money into this thing and if the market goes up you you you, you get that and if the market goes down then you can't lose anything um, it's never that simple and these companies believe me um, these companies didn't get as big as they are by uh, selling products where they were going to have to pay out on some guarantee and lose money um, and boring is okay. That's, 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 I'm going to finish with boring is okay. Um, mutual funds, when, when you buy a portfolio of mutual funds and you have asset allocation and you're split between large cap and small cap and growth and value and domestic and international and stocks and bonds, um, it is not very exciting. I'll be the first one to tell you, you know, 
Um, my mutual funds don't split two for one. They don't have a blowout quarter. Um, they don't, you know, CNBC, I get to go on CNBC every now and then, and, and the reason that they don't put me on there as much as they might is because they want me to answer questions like, what do you think will be the best mutual fund for the next three months? Well, how in the heck do I know that? Nobody does, but that's what they do. They're all about boom, boom, boom. Let's make that money right now. Well, it's you know they've got 12 hours of programming they have to fill every day, and so they they got to talk about something. Um, the bottom line is that if you want excitement, go to the casino. Um, I, I mean that sincerely. I um, I I'm a blackjack player. I love the game of blackjack. I love the math behind it. I've read every single book there is. Um, I'm not a card counter, I, but I can remember cards better than other people. Um, I am, I love the, the mathematics of the game. There, you know, it, it's a fascinating, but when I go to the casino, I'm not playing with my grocery money. I'm not playing with my kids' college money. I'm not playing with my retirement money. I'm playing with the same money that I might otherwise use to buy Royals tickets if they were any good, okay? Um, <laughs> Brought it all back together. That's good. Um, so, bottom line is boring is okay for your investments. If you want recreation, go to a casino. You're going to know within an hour or two if it's going to work out or not. Um, you don't have to wait. You know, you don't have to wait years and years. But if what we're talking about is your serious money, then then boring is, is fine. Okay. And with that, I will um, invite Miss Emily up here and uh, take questions. I'm going to pick up the blue card without having things fall in my pocket. Explain the difference between a Roth IRA. My mic? There we go. Uh, explain the difference between a Roth IRA and a regular IRA in 25 words or less. <laughs> this is, I like this because it's kind of like a contest. Um, it's a game. Basically, um, a regular IRA, you make contributions using um, pre-tax dollars. You either get a tax deduction or you pay the taxes first. The money grows tax deferred, and when you take it out, you will be taxed on the growth. With a Roth IRA, you use after-tax dollars, and when you take the money out, you will never have to pay taxes on those withdrawals assuming that the Congress doesn't ever change the tax code, which <laughs> may or may not happen. May I join you? Uh, please. <laughs> please. Um, I'm, I'm glad you're here, actually, because this is about the, um, I, I, by the way, tomorrow is my 20th wedding anniversary. And, oh, um, congratulations. Um, in a row to the same girl. Um, but the... Um, that hour that I was just talking was about the longest I've gone without a woman telling me what to do. So, uh, <laughs> so that's why I'm here. Yes, exactly. Okay. All righty. Um, we've got some really wonderful questions. And if you've not yet turned yours in, people are coming along the aisles, and you can pass them to the aisle, and we'll pick them up for you. And we'll get to as many as we can tonight, okay? First question, do you have a favorite mutual fund company? Do I have a favorite mutual fund company? Um, the answer to that is no, I do not. Um, the reality is that there is no single mutual fund company that has a lock on all the really good funds. Um, you look at companies like Fidelity. Fidelity is the, is the largest mutual fund company in the world. Um, they have more than 100 mutual funds. They've got a couple, a handful, that are really, really good. They've got a handful that are just horrendous. And then the rest are just kind of okay. Well, that's the way it is with every mutual fund company. Um, they will have one fund that is exceptional. You know, and what I say is, why limit yourself to one fund company? Instead, let's pick the best fund, or rather the best fund manager, regardless of what fund company they're from, and not just buy one company's fund. So your advice is really to look at the manager first, and then to the fund? Uh, yeah, the, the name of the fund doesn't matter. The manager is what counts. Um, the bottom line is that in, in, in mutual funds, like every other 
business that is out there, every other field, there are some people that are better at it than others. And we want to pick those very best ones. Um, I hope this story isn't too off color. And I know my staff's going to get nervous when I, when I start a sentence like that. Um, I remember when um, my oldest daughter, Caitlin, was born, uh, my wife was a nurse at St. Luke's Hospital. And she said, look, Adam, when I get ready to have this baby, any of the anesthesiologists can give me the epidural except for these two guys. And she gave me, now, those guys w were still doctors. They still had all this training. They had the same certificates, all those kinds of things. But she had seen them stick a needle into people's backs, and she didn't want them to do it to her. Okay? Now, the reality is, at the time when my daughter was born, I'm pretty sure she would have let me put the epidural in. Um, <laughs> um, but um, th the point is that she knew that there were some doctors that are better than others. And she knew which ones because of her experience. Well, the same thing is true. It doesn't matter what the name of the mutual fund is. What counts is that person or a couple of people who every day make those buy, sell, and hold decisions. Okay. Who would you suggest a new investor, and that's defined here as someone with less than $10,000, should go to for advice? Um, here's the thing is... When you have less than $10,000 to invest, um, it's very difficult to find somebody that's going to help you. Um, that's why, so for example, one of the things that I have, that we have done forever and for always at the mutual fund stores, is some, we, we have a $50,000 account minimum. If somebody calls and says, well, I've got $10,000. I have instructed all of my advisors across the country. You, answer, you help them to get into the right place. In other words, we can't accept them as a client and manage their account on a daily basis but we can at least point them in the right direction. And, you know, so I, for that person, I think, um, number one, you listen to that really good radio show every Saturday about mutual funds. Um, at 10 a.m.? At, at 10 a.m., exactly, that's the one. Um, and then, um, you know, read a little bit and, you know, find somebody that, that at least will point you in the right direction. What would you say are your immediate goals for your company? Immediate goals? That's what the card says. The immediate goals for my company. Um, well, what I want to do is we just want to keep doing more of what we've been doing. And, um, you know, we, we only do one thing, and that's we help people manage their investments using mutual funds. We do it for individuals, and we do it for small businesses or their 401ks, and that's all we do. Um, like I said, we have somewhere between 16 and 18,000 clients uh, across the country. Um, that's, I'd like to get to 2,450,000. And I, I give my word right here that um, I will be nice and do the right thing for every single one of them. So that, that's all we want to do. Why do you think some brokers advise people 65 years and over to sell mutual funds and stocks and buy safe investments like bonds and T-bills? So here's the thing. Um, what, what happens is, first of all, people, younger people, they always go, oh, you should save for retirement. Okay, why? They never tell you why. You know, just you should save for retirement. That's what they always tell you. Well, the answer is that the reason you save for retirement is to accumulate a pool of money from which you can create an income stream in, to supplement your income in retirement. So you get your Social Security, maybe get a little pension, and, and then you've got this other money that you can take money out of your account each month. Um, there is a traditional school of thought that once you retire and you have no ability to earn more money, that you should just protect that. But the reality is that that is a huge mistake. Now, I believe that a portion of of people's money, retired people and people approaching retirement should be in safer, less volatile investments. But they're also going to need a growth component because the reality is, and especially now, you know, it used to be people would retire at 65 and die at 70. Now people, you know, retire at, at 65 and live to be 90, 92, like my, uh, eight, more than 80, like my grandmother. <laughs> um, what she, kind of car did you buy her, by the way? She got this inf Infinity G35X, and I wanted I, I wanted something with like a lot of um, airbags and um, I, 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 GPS. I, well, actually, what I was trying to decide was 
whether I was going to get her a car that was good for her or a car that was good for the rest of society. Because I, I figured, like, if I got her a Hummer or something like that, then when she hit things, that it would protect her, but then the rest of society might be harmed. So um, I tried, I tried, tried to find the best of, of both worlds there. But, but ultimately, um, when you retire, you, even if you are retired and you don't have an income anymore, things are going to cost more 10 years from now than they cost right now. And you've got to have that growth component if you're going to, um, if you're going to successfully, you know, not run out of money um, before the end of your life. What is your prediction for interest rates and Fed moves for the rest of the year? Sweet. Um, well, I don't really know, and there's nobody nobody that knows. Um, I love how I, you know, I'm, I'm not picking on CNBC. I really do like CNBC, but I, and I have it going all day long. So. I watch, and they bring one guy on there, and he goes, oh, interest rates are definitely going up, absolutely. And then the next guy, you know, it's some PhD economist guy. And they bring on another one, and he goes, oh, interest rates are definitely going down. They're going to cut rates. And um, nobody knows for sure. What I do know is this. Um, right now, we have a, an interest rate environment. We have an economic environment that is about as good as anybody could hope for. The economy is growing. Corporate profits are growing, but not too much. Um, if we're, we're nearing full employment, but we're not, um, things aren't hyperinflated. In it. So my expectation is that we will see interest rates fluctuate between four and a half, the 10 year treasury will fluctuate between four and a half and five and a half percent between now and the end of the year. And that when the Federal Reserve does make its next move, it will be down. They will cut rates rather than raise rates but I don't think there's going to be anything possibly. They may go the rest of the year and not do it. If they do, it'll be towards the end of the year. Thank you. And here's somebody who says there's a lot of seminars out there, and what they're hearing is that annuities are the thing to do. Do you yeah. feel you've spoken to that? <laughs> or do you think there's anything more you can tell us about annuities versus mutual funds? Well, um, Anybody that's listened to my radio show, and I'm going to assume that people that are that are here tonight have, have listened to the radio show, know I'm not a big fan of annuities. Um, so I'm not going to do an expanded discussion of that. What I can tell you is that I put annuities into the list of uh, products that have been created to um, appeal to people who are scared of the markets. And the mutual fund, co the, the annuity companies and the insurance companies are getting really, really good at creating these new products and marketing, saying things in a way that scared investors will respond to. Now, as far as the seminars go, there are companies out there that are in the business of marketing to seniors. If you ever see, if you ever get something from somebody who is a certified senior advisor, okay, do you know how you become a certified senior advisor? This designation that they, they have is there, there's this company and you pay them money to subscribe to their service. And what they do is they have market, they, they send out cards and they do um, mailings to senior citizens and get them to come to seminars. So you become a senior citizen, a senior advisor by a certified senior advisor by paying this company money to market for you so that you can go to seminars and sell annuities. Um, the bottom line, there's a lot of these schemes out there and um, most of them are, are, are not good. Okay. Now this one has an attachment. So uh -oh. It says Peter Newman on KFDC speaks highly of ETF funds, ETFs, but you don't. And mm -hmm. could you defend your position versus Peter Newman's position? Okay. Um, so let me say a couple of things. First of all, um, Peter Newman um, is has been a good friend and mentor of mine for a lot of years. Um, I, the way that I got on the radio was being a guest on Peter's show. Um, and when I first got my show on KBZ, the first station we were on, and now we're coast to coast, but the first station I got on was here in town, and that's because Peter helped me, and he's somebody, I, I talked with him this afternoon. Um, and I will tell you that um, there is no, nobody in this country that I would want to, um, that I would rather go to for obscure knowledge of the tax code than Peter Newman. He knows more about that stuff. That's than he's been here twice, and we know. So, he knows the obscure stuff. So I got there, there's there's a lot of love going on up here for Peter Newman. Um, that being said, um, he's an accountant. 
I'm an investment advisor. Um, so, you know, ETFs, um, he, he, the bottom line is that uh, Peter has a guest who appears on his show from time to time who is a proponent of ETFs, and um, since then, Peter likes ETFs more than he used to. Um, the, the, uh, I, I think that for most people, unless you're going to be a day trader, unless you're going to try and aggressively time the market and those kinds of things, that ETFs are, are not the way to go. Most of the, uh, in fact, um, all the ETFs that are out there are index funds. And they're, they're narrow index. They have one for, you know, energy stocks and one for, you know, but th they are index funds. And I believe that when you buy an index fund, you're accepting mediocrity. The people, the people at Vanguard, the people that are proponents of index funds will say, well, at least if you own the index, you know you'll never do worse than the market. And while that's true, you also know that you'll never do better than the market. And I think that we can, over time, do better than the market by finding those very talented managers. And those managers aren't working at ETFs, they're working at regular mutual funds. Thank you. I'm going to tell Peter that you did a great job. I hope he's not mad at me. <laughs> OK, would you please discuss, this says unit investment trusts. Are we singing? Yeah. Okay. Unit investment trusts. Um, or UITs as they're known, uh, because we love acronyms. Um, unit investment trust, it's sort of like a mutual fund in that it is a basket of, of stocks and or bonds. Um, they have unit, trust, unit investment trusts that have um, the 30 stocks in the Dow. They have unit investment trusts that, that um, have municipal bonds in them, whatever the case may be. What differentiates a unit investment trust from a mutual fund is that with a mutual fund, you have a manager who every day is making the buy, sell, and hold decisions. They will evaluate the stocks and or bonds that they own in their fund and decide which ones to keep and which ones to sell and what to replace it with. With a unit investment trust, when you buy it today, you're getting those 30 stocks, and those 30 stocks or bonds or whatever the case may be stay the same and never change. So regardless of what happens with the market conditions, whether a stock uh, uh, falls out of favor, whatever the case may be, the stocks in a unit investment trust never change. So it's basically an unmanaged mutual fund. I can't see any reason that somebody would want to buy an unmanaged mutual fund. Mm -hmm. Okay, why can't I get my broker to set a return goal better than the S&P 500? That is a reasonable goal. Um, as I told you, I don't think any, any bro anybody that says to you, well, I think um, I, I will give you 10% of your returns. I'll give you 12% of your returns. There's no way to know what the market's going to do. Now, what I do think that an investment advisor can do is to set benchmarks. Okay, um, if your account is going to be all stocks, then I think the S&P 500 is a fair benchmark. And if you're going to pay fees for somebody to help you manage your investments, I think that it is appropriate that over time that they should be able to outperform the S&P 500 with the stock portion. If you're somebody who has a balanced account, you have some stocks and some bonds, then you need to compare the stock part to the S&P 500 and compare the bond part to a bond index um, or whatever the case may be. Um, and I think that what we're talking about there is relative performance. And you know that's, that's, that's what we're all shooting for. In other words, when you're paying fees, you need to receive value for those fees. You should expect more than just magic beans. It's going to be all right. It's, there's going to be a bean stock. Um, and one of the things that you should expect is, is performance, and that's a way of measuring. I think that is a fair expectation. Generally speaking, can an investor use or buy U.S. savings bonds to do most of the things that an annuity can do, but without? This is rear-end fees. Um, the problem with savings bonds is that the government doesn't pay very much. Um, they used to be a really sweet deal. There, were, there was special taxation on savings bonds that they don't have anymore. It's really not, savings bonds are not that good a deal. Now what you can do is you can buy things like zero coupon bonds. And I don't wanna spend a lot of time talking about, th there, there are things that an investment advisor can do and there are strategies that, that we can employ that will give you most of the, the same features of the annuity, but without the negative aspects. 
With your aggressive and rapid expansion of your business, mm -hmm. explain how your own everyday involvement will continue to oversee the everyday operation as you have in the past. Well, um, the great part about our expansion and, and the growth of the company has been that um, I get to do the parts of the job that I really like and I've got other people to do <sighs> the parts that I don't. So. Um, basically, my role is as follows. Number one, first and foremost, I am chief investment officer of the company. I spend a great portion of my time talking with fund managers, talking with economists, talking with people, trying to figure out which are the best mutual funds for our clients, uh, what proportions we should have in various funds and asset classes for our clients, et cetera. Um, the second thing I do is I do, um, I am, the face of the mutual fund store. So I get to come and give speeches like this and do so all over the country. Um, I do the radio show, I do the television appearances, that kind of stuff. And then lastly, uh, I am in charge of strategic vision for the company. Um, I think of things that, immodestly, um, which I don't do that very well either, but um, immodestly, I, I think of things that other people don't. And, and so th th those are my roles. The rest of the stuff, the day-to-day -day running of the company, um, is now I've got other people that are doing it, and quite honestly, they're a lot better at it than I ever was. Okay, we have more questions that I'm going to get now, and while I'm doing that, you here's again? a question for you. Oh, okay. What do you think about energy funds? Um, I think uh, we all know what's what, we all know what's happened to uh, the price of oil and in turn gasoline over the last couple of years, right? Um, <coughs> We're sixty-six dollars a barrel, roughly. Three gas is over three dollars a gallon, where you know it was a buck and a half, two bucks. Um, and consequently, the energy stocks and consequently the energy funds have done really, really well. Stupendous, excellent, superior returns over the last several years. Um, create you know b big time returns. You know we're talking thirty, forty percent a year for the last several years. Now, I don't know what's going to happen next. I don't know whether um, energy oil keeps going up, but I'm pretty sure that we're not going to see a doubling in the price of oil over the next couple of years like we have over the last few years. And as a result, it seems to me that the easy money has been made in the energy sector and that buying an energy fund right now would be a bit like buying a technology fund at the end of 1999. And so I think that um, the... While there, I'm not saying that, that energy will go down, what I am saying is that I think that the when you look at the upside that's still left in the sector versus the possibility of a 50% correction, that the risk and reward are just kind of out of whack right now. Okay. What's the best way to evaluate investments in a corporate 401k program? Um, okay, so here's what you have to do with your 401k. Um, Number one, uh, you have to decide what you want your asset allocation to be first. Before you even consider which funds to choose, you have to decide, okay, how much do I want in large cap growth, how much in large cap value, et cetera. And then what you do is you, once you've decided how much you want to have in each kind of fund, you look at the fund choices that your company offers, and then you pick the best of the funds that for, for each of those asset classes. And then you have to watch it over a period of time because things change. Um, mm -hmm. We, this is, once again, not, not an infomercial, but um, I did start a second company called smart401k.com. Um, and the reason I started that company was, this is the most common question I get on the radio shows. People call up and they go, Adam, I work for this company, and they give me you know this list of 20 or 30 or 40 mutual funds, and I don't know which ones to pick. And so, um, the way smart401k.com works is you tell us, you give us that list of funds. We have real live investment advisors that help you pick those funds. So if you're going to do it yourself, start with the asset allocation and then pick the best of the funds and then monitor. If you don't, if you're not in a position where you want to do it or can't do it yourself, then you know, we do have smart401k.com out there. But it is okay to look at it and to change your mind about things if you want yeah, to. Yeah, but not every day. Because, you know, mutual funds are not buying forget investments, but they're not buying look at everyday investments either because that'll just get you an ulcer. And um, 
the, the bottom line is I, I, I contend that a lot of the volatility that we have in the market is a function of the fact that um, people have too much information, uh, particularly with their, their retirement accounts. You know, it used to be, um, I remember when I, when I first entered the workforce, I had a 401k. So we had this 401k, and they would send me a statement once a quarter to tell me how my 401k was doing, and it was always like three months late. You know, so like, you know, for the year ended December, they, you'd get it in March. Okay, and so what happened though was four times a year, you were looking at your account and making this, okay, maybe I should switch things around. Well, now what they've done is everybody's gone online, and so you can look at it every single day. And so if there are 200 market days in a year, people are looking at their accounts 50 times more often than they used to, and as a result, they're more susceptible to making changes based on what they see on TV that day or um, you know, some article they've read, whereas it used to be because you only got, you had to do it through the mail and an 800 number, people didn't change it as much. So I don't think you change it all the time, you just monitor and make changes as necessary. Okay. Here's an interesting question. How does the mutual fund store match an advisor to a client? Um, that's a good question. Um, and I'm not saying that the rest of them weren't good questions, by the way. Um, the, basically what we've done is we have, um, it, when I started the company, it was just me. So, you know, every client got me. Um, and then um, the co company continued to grow, and so I, I hired another advisor, and then I hired another advisor. And kind of what we, we do is we have a certain number of investment advisors who are taking new clients, and we have other investment advisors who have been with me for a number of years and have uh, a big enough client base that what they spend their time doing is just taking care of their existing clients. Mm -hmm. um, what I can tell you unequivocally is that it, if you go to any mutual fund store location in this country, including those here in Kansas City, I don't care which advisor you talk to. Number one, I'm making, I make, I choose the funds. They're working off of my list of funds. I, I put together the asset allocation templates, but more importantly, I don't care where you go, um, there's not a one of them that I wouldn't let manage my money. Um, I, we have just this incredibly great group of people, and we're very selective. We have, I can tell you, um, that we have far more people that want to work for us than we have positions for people, so we've, we've gotten to be very selective. Great. How should someone in their early 30s diversify between before tax 401k or IRA and after tax accounts like a Roth? Okay. Um, I think that whether you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, it doesn't really matter. I, I, um, I think the answer is, is the same, and that is that um, I like 401ks. Um, I like 403bs, retirement plans at work, and I like them for several reasons. Number one, um, you're using pre-tax dollars. So, wh wh so what happens is when you put money into your retirement plan at work, you're going to get growth on the money that you contribute to that, to that 401k. You're going to get growth if there's on any contributions the company makes. You're gonna get growth on your growth, but most importantly, you're gonna get growth on the money that you would otherwise pay in taxes. And so um, the money, even if you have decent funds in your 401k, that's as good as having good funds outside your 401k because you don't, you're getting the money in on a pre-tax basis. Now, that being said, it's also important to have some money that is not in your retirement plans because sometimes the furnace breaks. Sometimes your car, you get in an accident that was no fault of your own and you have to pay the deductible for the insurance. Sometimes you have three teenage daughters that all need braces at the same time uh, or need to go to college at the same time or need to go to Abercrombie & Fitch at the same time. Um, I'm, Anecdotally, let's just say. You sound like you're speaking from experience. <laughs> Perhaps. I, I think, um, you know, we were talking earlier about those awards that I had won. I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure that with my three daughters that Abercrombie, I should get some kind of prize from them too. So. <laughs> <laughs> if there were only two investment choices, and they were a bank CD or a total market index fund, which would you choose? Well, um, That would be pretty boring, but. That would be boring. Um, 
first of all, there, there aren't only two choices. So this is a ridiculous, like, that's like one of those questions like, um, you know, which of your kids would you kill first? You know? <laughs> um, um, the, um, the bottom line is that, you know, the total market index, uh, so, so here, here's a better, I'm going to rephrase that question, okay? And that is, you know, are index funds bad? That's really the, the, the question. You know, bank CD, you're, you're never, you know, you, you can't stay ahead of inflation with a bank CD. So, so we know that. But ultimately, index funds aren't bad. I get a lot of people that call the show, and they own, like, really terrible funds. I mean, really horrible, awful funds that, that have been doing them harm. Mm -hmm. um, index funds aren't bad. They're not the best. But I, so given a choice between an index fund and a bad fund, I'll take the index fund. Um, I think we can do better, but... I don't ever want to be on the, I'm not saying they're bad, I'm just saying I think we can do better than that. Mm -hmm. Can an annuity, when the time runs out, be transferred to the mutual fund store? Yes, and even before then. <laughs> um, um, the, the answer is we don't, we do help people manage their annuities, um, but the annuities that we use to, to so if you have an annuity, um, we have a couple of different um, annuity companies that we use, but instead of having annual expenses in the one and a half to three and a half percent uh, range that most of these annuity companies do. They're in the like one quarter of a percent to four tenths of a percent range for the annuity products that we use. So we don't ever sell people those annuities with new money, but if they already have an annuity, we can transfer it in and, and save the, uh, preserve the tax status so they, they don't have to pay taxes on it. Okay. Do you know Dave Ramsey and what do you think of him? Um, I don't know Dave Ramsey, and um, you know, the, and I've never met Bob Brinker. Um, I've never met. I actually, I've met Susie Orman briefly uh, one time, but you know, she doesn't know. There's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of people who have opinions, and, and I'll be the first one to tell you, um, the system that I have developed at the at the mutual fund store over the last 11 years for picking mutual funds and for having asset allocation and all those kinds of things. It is not the only way to do well with your investments over the long run. Now, it's a good way, and I, I think, personally, I think it's the best way. But th there's other people that have good strategies out there and other people that, that do good things that are, that are different than, than what we do. Um, so I think, you know, the world is, is there's, there's a lot of talented people out there, and there's going to always be a lot of differing opinions out there. Are Susie Orman's teeth that white in person? Because aren't um, they white? They're very white. Yeah, <laughs> she um, she doesn't seem like. Oh, never mind. Okay. Moving on. Were there not television cameras here, I would finish that statement. We'll talk about it. Later. Yeah, exactly. Fund managers are retiring. So, what as an investor can you do? Should you pull out? Should you just wait, or what? Well, most of the time when a fund manager retires, see, anytime uh, there's a change of fund management, you have to start watching the fund much more closely than you would have otherwise. Um, typically, when a fund manager retires, they don't just retire out of the blue. They, um, th they say, okay, I'm going to retire in 2010. So they've got three years to train a protege to run the fund afterwards. Um, what I typically do is if it is that kind of situation where a fund manager retires and their protege, somebody they've personally trained and has been there working with them, takes over the fund, then um, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt for a little while and see how they do. But you definitely have to watch it much more closely than you would have if the manager had st still been there. Okay. I've had a couple folks ask here about uh, A.G. Edwards. Any, any words about that specific company? Um, well, um, as most of you, A.G. Edwards was uh, last week has entered into um, an agreement to be acquired by Wachovia. Um, Wachovia is a big banking company. They also, they bought Prudential Securities. That This will make them one of the three largest brokerage houses in the country. Um, AG Edwards is a fine company, an ethical company. I don't have any ethical issues with them, um, but they are a commission-based brokerage house. And so, you know, I think that the system is set up in a way where they're the people, the brokers that work for them, are, are, are 
uh, re financially rewarded for engaging in transactions rather than financially rewarded for managing their clients' accounts and doing well over extended periods of time. Do you think the mutual fund store will ever be on the New York Stock Exchange? Um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I don't have any plans to do a, a, an IPO in, in the next month or two. Um, someday, who knows? Um, right now, we're doing what we do, and we're doing more of it, and I'm having a good time, and so who knows? Is it important to return proxy notes on your accounts? Um, well, for um, for our clients at the mutual fund store, we vote the proxies for all of our clients on the mutual funds that, that we hold for them. Um, you know, if you are a normal investor and you have a small proportion, you know, you have a ten or twenty thousand dollar account in a mutual fund, then maybe not a big deal. Um, if you're Norm Polsky, it's probably more important. <laughs> Are foreign funds less volatile than U.S. mutual funds, and how do you decide which foreign funds are the best? Well, um, first of all, the way that you, let's go backwards, um, the way that you measure foreign funds is against what's called the EFA index, the EAFE, -E -E, it's the Europe-Australia Far East index. Just like I was saying, you have to compare the performance of your stock funds versus the S&P 500. You have to do the same thing on your international funds, but you can't compare it to the, to the S&P 500, you have to compare it to, to the markets outside, and we do that with the EFA index. Um, as far as whether they're less volatile, the, the international markets have done better, the markets outside the U.S. on the whole have done better over the last several years than the markets inside the U.S., um, but every dog has its day, and sooner or later, you know, as soon as you figure out that, oh, the markets outside the U.S. do better than the U.S., and people start putting all their money overseas, and guess what? The U.S. market will start doing better, and you know people because people tend to jump after something has happened and had a big move rather than before. Okay, I think this is going to be our last question for tonight. But what one thought should I leave here with after listening to you tonight? Uh, um, or two thoughts? Yeah, I'll give you one thought. Um, it's really I, I will go to my core. When in doubt, I go to my core philosophy, and that is. If you're going to take the risk of the market, you owe it to yourself to be in the best investments possible. And there are a lot of options out there. There are stocks, there are bonds, there are mutual funds, and there's 23,000 of them, and there's unit investment trusts and ETFs and annuities and all these things that we talked about tonight. There's all these, 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 these um, things that are out there. Um, if they all have risks, some of them come with thicker books than others. Um, but they all have risks. They all have um, upside potential and downside risks. Um, but the bottom line is that if you're going to take that risk, don't just accept mediocrity. Too many people in this world will accept mediocrity. You're taking all that risk. You owe it to yourself to be in those best investments. And if you can do it yourself, do the homework, do the research, great. I believe that there's a large segment of the population that can do that. If you can't, then find somebody honest, somebody who's hardworking, somebody who has your best interests in mind that will do it for you. Very good. Thank you very much, Adam Bullock, for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. And before you go, I only have three things to say. Cookies in the lobby, books for sale in the lobby, and turn in your green cards. And good night, thank you for coming. Thank you.